Belize turning down COVID test kits sounds crazy, but it's true. We'll tell you about the disturbing news out of Sika tonight. And breaking the stigma of COVID-19 tonight, two patients speak. time to sign up for the best postpaid plans in the country because Digi has double the data in all their plans. Now you can get even more done, connect even more, stream even more, create even more and share even more. All on the fastest mobile network that gives you the most coverage nationwide. Now is the time to go postpaid with plans starting as low as $49 monthly. Shared plans are also available, all with unlimited talk and text. So don't wait. Hurry over to your nearest Digi store to sign up today. Enjoy double the data in all postpaid plans only with Digi. Ask any landscape professional who they depend We 
do these things without thinking. Nine eight seven six five four three two one. Care about? Call Crime Stoppers to anonymously report criminal activity in your area. By working together, we can make our Belize a safer place. This message is brought to you by Crime Stoppers Belize and this station. Ask any landscape professional who they depend on for professional-grade power tools, and the answer is always the same. Echo. 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 Ask any dealer who offers the most powerful, most durable, and most reliable equipment in the business, and they'll tell you. Echo. 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 Then ask yourself, doesn't your lawn and garden deserve the professional's choice? Echo. 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 The best outdoor power equipment you can buy. At Medisco, we have everything you need to be the master of your kitchen. We carry spices, sauces, seafood, cheeses, assorted veggies carefully selected and packaged to ensure freshness. All the ingredients that you need to make that gourmet meal. Our distribution centers in Belize City, Belmopan, and San Pedro do timely deliveries so you can depend on us when preparing your elegant meals. From La Promesa, Global Chef, Global Supreme, only the best quality products for your table. So remember, just call any of our distribution centers when you're ready to add some edge to your menu and more flavor to your dishes. <music> In compliance with the COVID-19 pandemic regulations and guidelines established by the Ministry of Health and the Government of Belize, Central TV and Internet advises you that we will be implementing the following changes to our opening hours effective April 2nd, 2020. Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Saturday, closed. While our offices remain open, we have been following all precautionary measures to protect both you and our employees. We have installed markers on the floor to indicate standing distance to adhere to the physical distancing requirements, as well as the plexiglass barriers. If you would like assistance, please feel free to contact us through any of our communication outlets. We thank you for your continued support and encourage everyone to stay informed. Let's continue to practice self-care and community care by remaining mindful of each other and practicing precautionary measures guided by the health officials. Next Gen, powered by Central TV and Internet. Test, test, test. That's what all the experts say is the key to stopping or slowing COVID-19. And compared to countries that are having success against the virus, Belize isn't testing nearly enough of the population. But tonight, 7 News has learned that something after March, sometime after March 12th, that is, Belize turned down the donation of as many as 25,000 testing kits from South Korea. 
A leaked SICA memo says, quote, the tests are 99% accurate and are compatible with those used by all SICA member countries with the exception of Belize, which is why they declined the donation. The tests are on their way to Honduras to be distributed equitably among SICA member countries. So Belize never got that donation, and right now the country has about 700 tests and is running short of a key testing element. Additionally, now tests are hard to source right now. The Director of Health Services, Dr. Marvin Manzanero, gave an overview today. We do have test kits and enzymes to run um, as, um, at least 700 tests, um, but I do have to state that just like in the regions we are uh, running low on the viral swabs, which is a little um, um, uh, specific um, lab equipment that you use to be able to take a viral swab, and uh, we're trying to outsource that. Uh, we had thought we would have, could have gotten one uh, a batch next week. Uh, we are working with the PAHO regional office, but uh, all countries are having a difficulty in terms of accessing that um, vi those viral swabs. So, um, we'll, we'll, I mean, I'm saying that because I know one of the things that everybody's requesting is uh, they want to be tested for SARS-CoV-2, but it doesn't necessarily um, work like that yet. And we are not at the stage where we are going to be just about swabbing everybody. We had said that maybe in the next four to six weeks um, is when we can have access to rapid tests and make that available to people much more routinely. We were unable to get comment this evening from the Ministry of Health on what was the compatibility issue that made Belize turn down the donation made by Kabe. Tonight, finally, two of Belize's COVID-19 patients are breaking the stigma wrongly associated with contracting the virus. Nigel Espat and Ramsley Gillett are patients number six and number eight. Tonight, they are each speaking out in their own way to share their experience of the symptoms with Belizeans and to say it's an opportunistic virus and not anything to be ashamed about. We spoke to Espat via phone at his home in Cayo, where he told Cherise Halsal that he's doing well, all things considered. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I, um, I feel very good health-wise. Um, as the days progress, I'm feeling better and better from the, the mild symptoms that I experience. So I'm, I'm convinced that I'm on my way to recovery. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I got it from patient number four, from Hubert Piper's who, who has, um, for the past two years, been riding back and forth from San Ignacio to BC to me in my vehicle. No? He does it probably about an average of two or three times a week. What were, what were you feeling when you heard that uh, Hubert Pipersburg had died? Well, I, I was devastated. I was, I was torn apart. I mean, Hubert has has been a good friend for many years, and um, even now, I'm, I'm I'm saddened by his passing. I I wish it wasn't so. You know, I I, I wish me that that. My phone will ring when this thing is all over and I get that usual um, morning phone call. Hey, bro, can, can I get a ride? You know, and I wish that that could, could be a reality again. But that, that, that is a hope in me. But I know it's, it's, not a, it's not going to happen because he's no longer with us. So now, how did you feel when you realized that you had contracted, you know, this disease that people all over the world are going really crazy about from, from someone who's a dear friend? Well, I I in, I was shocked when I was phoned on Monday morning to say that my um, results had come back positive. I was shocked because I wasn't experiencing any of the symptoms that are were being told are common for this disease. So I haven't experienced any coughing as yet, um, no fevers whatsoever, and no respiratory problems. Um, What's more is I have an oximeter, and since I've been, I, I tested positive, I've been testing the oxygen concentration in my blood, and I'm somewhere on average about 98%. So, so I'm doing good in terms of respiration. The only thing that I did have, which perhaps fooled me, because I suffer seasonal allergies, and especially in this time of year that they're, all the flowers are in bloom, I experienced a severe case 
of sinusitis. And what was new was that I lost all sense of taste and smell. But besides that, none of the, what, what would be perhaps some of the traditional symptoms of COVID-19, I am yet to receive any of those. And I am now today at day 16. So you don't have any underlying health conditions other than the allergies? I am diabetic. I am diabetic. And so perhaps that was what made it easy to contract, you know, because um, what the experts are showing is that um, people with underlying conditions, say like like asthma or diabetes, are, are more prone to getting it. There has been, since Monday, there has been somewhat of a sense of, of anxiety because um, for several reasons. Number one, it is, you know, we're, we're looking at this thing on the television for the past three, perhaps four months and seeing how many people are dying from it and how serious it gets. So there is there is that, that anxiety in me to say, well, I have this thing and God knows what can happen. You know, whilst I'm feeling good today, suppose I take a turn for the worse tomorrow. So that does exist. I, I have to be truthful about that. There is also the anxiety that uh, has built up because I'm yet to receive the results from my wife and my kids. We... Um, we received some good news today that my parents um, are negative. I was especially worried about my, my dad, who is a chronic asthmatic. And he came back negative along with my mom and some other family members that I had contact with. Um, some of the people that I work with, they, they all came back negative. So I'm hoping that, that, that we get some good news as regards my wife and, and kids. I think there's a lot of rumors out there and speculation, and I, I'm hoping it stops. And, and that that is why I have um, I have agreed to come out and talk about this in in a, in the hope to to end the stigma and, and the discrimination, albeit perhaps minor, but still we don't want it to to grow and 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 to take root. So, yeah, I, I think we should stick to the facts. And while his fat is is discouraging the spreading of rumors, so is patient eight. He's Ramsey Gillett, a 50-year-old lands inspector at the Ministry of Natural Resources in Belmopan. He lives and works in Corozal with a wife and two children, and he is now in the isolation area of a Corozal community hospital. Via his sister page, he put up a compelling personal statement on Facebook this afternoon. It says, quote, It is my belief that I contracted the coronavirus while regularly engaged in my duties as a public servant. I have decided to make this public declaration with the hope of ending the stigma and discrimination that I've seen displayed against other COVID-19 patients and their families. My request to all fellow citizens is for you to give my family and I your support during this very difficult time. We are a God-fearing family and we ask you to join your prayers with ours at this time. I'm currently in the care of the healthcare system of Belize and my plea is that the government does all that it is and can do in its power to care for and provide the best medical services to those like myself who are affected by this deadly virus. Please ensure that there is wider spread testing and that the parameters for determining when somebody will be tested is now widened to include those who may not have a travel history outside Belize. Please afford prompt and courteous service to all who make an outreach and attempt to engage the public health services of our country. My experience in the aforementioned could certainly have been different. Finally, I request of all once more the support and respect for my family and I as we go through this very difficult time. End quote. In a very measured statement, Gillett makes it clear that his interaction with the public health system has been less than optimal. Reports to us suggest that he was not tested until he exhibited serious symptoms. That is notable, because, but today the Director of Health Services did not comment on his experience because the statement was posted just as this afternoon's as the expert session was about to start. Dr. Manzanero did, however, speak at a length about his present condition in the hospital, including the fact that he has diabetes. So in terms of the patient we detected yesterday, it's a 50-year-old male. He has one precondition, he's a diabetic. He was swabbed, um, he do doesn't really have respiratory symptoms now, but he did refer having had respiratory symptoms, um, being seen at a private facility, 
being treated with antibiotics in a private facility. So when he came into the health system, it's because he was having minor respiratory symptoms, but primarily um, uh, abdominal pain and diarrhea. Um, so that was what was documented. The patient is stable. I just checked before I came on. He's with uh, no respiratory um, symptoms. He is not without. Uh, he's without any oxygen, and he is. Uh, saturating at 96% without any supplementary oxygen with no respiratory condition at this point in time. So that patient is being managed at the uh, Corozal Community Hospital in the isolation area uh, away from the routine uh, Corozal Community Hospital patient set. So in terms of patient number eight, um, it doesn't, he doesn't have a travel history that much uh, we know other than uh, being across the border, but no travel history to, to the U.S. Uh, so we'll have to determine in the mapping exercise where he could have potentially become infected, uh, and that exercise started very early today. The patient number eight travel in public transportation to and from work. Uh, I haven't gotten the mapping exercise completed as yet. Um, I am not able to tell you or tell the audience how that, um, how that happened. Um, but what I, the preliminary report that one family member did say is that he had not been uh, going uh, to his routine workstation in the last two or three weeks after there had been a cut down of the public transportation. But that's going to come out in the exercise. So now with cases seven and eight, both not linked directly to any imported case, can we finally pronounce that there is community spread of COVID-19 in Belize? Well, that's what we asked Manzanero today, but he didn't seem quite ready to make that concession. Can we now see clearly and definitively say that we have community spread? Um, clearly and definitively is, is a very strong words. It, it seems to indicate so. Um, the mapping exercise that we will complete with patient number eight um, would guide us to that. Um, because it's not also how they became um, ill. It's how the potential of them having... Um, uh, infected others and who are the asymptomatic carriers that have not sought or, or will never seek um, medical attention. I think that's something that, that our mapping exercise today for patient number eight will be able to, uh, to see. And the mapping exercise for patients six and seven has been encouraging so far. A total of 31 samples of their primary contacts have come back negative for COVID-19. Manzanero discussed today. None of the family, immediate family members or primary contacts, as you would call them, or close contacts of patients six and seven turned out to be positive for SARS-CoV-2, the disease we now know as COVID-19. Um, nonetheless, these family members will have to wait out the, quarant the, the quarantine period um, at their wherever they are. And while those family members are negative, but remain under quarantine, the terrible reality is that the relatives of patient seven who is hospitalized at the KHMH cannot visit their loved ones in the isolation ward. That is because first, they are under quarantine, and second, because the highly infectious nature of COVID-19 makes it so that all over the world, those who are infected cannot have visitors. More than that, there is a strict and unforgiving protocol for dealing with those who die from COVID-19. Manzanero discussed this difficult subject today. This is very important and I, we have realized that we are going to have to have a discussion specific on how we handle um, cadavers. I know that that's not a topic that we would want to address, but I, I think in all fairness, in all honesty, if our curve, which is we're now starting to have a curve, if those numbers start to go up, if we're not able to contain it, and again, that's a joint venture with the community, um, I mean, people can be expected if the numbers start to go up, and depending on the population that's affected, that people um, will die. Um, there's specific recommendations in terms of what should be done um, with the cadaver of, of, um, of a patient who has died of COVID-19. We are not considering doing an autopsy on anybody who has a diagnosis of COVID-19. I need to say that of of the of the of the but almost immediately. We are also not considering that the body should be kept in the morgue um, 
for, I mean, not even an overnight um, stay. I mean, as long as the cadaver is, um, if you have a cadaver, then you have to find a means of getting it um, to the family, following the proper processes. Understand that somebody who is critically ill, has a COVID-19 situation, is not going to be allowed any visitation. Even the two patients, both in Corozal and Carl Huesner, um, visitors are not allowed. So you're not going to necessarily be seeing your family members. I know um, in the case of the patient um, number seven, he uh, does um, calls via his phone because he's not intubated. Um, but I mean, once you're intubated, there's not much that um, communication or connection that you're gonna be able to have with your sick family member. And we need to be able to say that. Um, Sometimes if you have been exposed because of your family member, you understand that you will also be on the um, either self-isolation if you are also diagnosed positive or under quarantine. So I, I know that that's a difficult message to be able to give to you, but you are also not going to be able to perhaps see your family member if they, if they die. Why? Because you yourself are under quarantine and self-isolation. So. Indeed, COVID-19 has remapped all our realities and many of us find ourselves cooped up with stress, paranoia and fear. But as Manzanaro pointed out today, it only makes their work harder when we turn a virus which can infect anyone into a badge of shame, treating a patient like a perpetrator. Well, that's not how it works. And as you heard, two COVID-19 patients are speaking up to end that stigma. Manzanero did the same today. From the information we are gathering that some people are being, we are starting to play a blame, a blame game as if the patients that are positive um, should be blamed for being COVID-19 positive. I am not so sure that that is the road we want to go because it could literally happen to any, any one of us. I mean, if we were in contact with an asymptomatic carrier, um, or we might ourselves be asymptomatic carriers, never develop any sign or symptom and still just be passing it on to others. That's why I think for the last two or three weeks we have been saying anybody you meet on the street, you have to assume that they are a COVID-19 case. And we take our first break now. When we come back, the Commissioner of Police goes off and three cops accused of coercing a man and woman into a sex act. He calls them idiots. Don't go away. What's better than unlimited text messages with your postpaid plan? How about unlimited national calls 24-7? Doesn't get any better than that, right? Actually, it does. Because with Smart's Plus postpaid plan, for only $120 a month, you also get unlimited data. You heard me right. Unlimited SMS, plus unlimited national calls, plus unlimited data. That is a real deal, right? The fact is that Smart is the only telecom company that offers two postpaid plans in Belize. You can talk as much as you want, text as much as you want, browse or stream or download movies and videos as much as you want. No limits. Now that's guaranteed happiness plus smart thinking. Never settle for cheap imitations when you can have smart plus postpaid plan. Only with smart, you get truly unlimited everything.
time to sign up for the best postpaid plans in the country because Digi has double the data in all their plans. Now you can get even more done, connect even more, stream even more, create even more, and share even more. All on the fastest mobile network that gives you the most coverage nationwide. Now is the time to go postpaid with plans starting as low as $49 monthly. Shared plans are also available, all with unlimited talk and text. So don't wait. Hurry over to your nearest Digi store to sign up today. Enjoy double the data in all postpaid plans only with Digi. Confused? Overwhelmed? Stay in the know with COVID-19 Watch. Weekdays at 9.30 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Channel 7 and also on Facebook at Colorblind Multimedia Productions, 7 News Belize and DigiBelize. Stay informed, stay vigilant, stay healthy. Tonight we return to a story that is not suitable for kids. So if they are watching, either excuse them from the room or please just change the channel for a bit. Last night we showed you a very blurred version of three police officers coercing two individuals into performing a sexual act. It's evidence that only exists because it was filmed and shared by the perpetrators. And on Monday night, when the vile video started making the WhatsApp rounds, it was brought to the attention of Commissioner of Police Chester Williams. Williams appeared viscerally disgusted this morning as he trudged out of the Raccoon Street Police Station to answer to the press about the gross misconduct his officers have displayed at a time of national emergency when the department has been virtually handed free reigns over Belizean society. Cherise Halsal reports. I have seen the video and uh 
it is perhaps one of the most disgusting things I have seen and uh, I cannot imagine what could have possessed those persons who are behind that video to have done so. It is already bad to force two people into sexual activity against their will. It is five times worse to video record it and ten times worse to share it publicly. I words cannot describe how I feel. And when people think that they are outraged and uh, we are not, I want to say to them that that is far from the truth. The video do outrage us. And it would outrage anyone to see two human beings robbed of their dignity and made to perform a degrading sex act in obedience to sadistic and depraved police officers. They made humans into subhumans. The male is an innocent agent. He was being coerced, as I said, by people with authority, officers of the law. And uh, I can say to you that from both accounts, the male and the female, they have said that there was no actual penetration. But notwithstanding that, from what I'm seeing, it could be a possible case of attempt rape and uh, conspiracy to commit rape. We have idiots like those behind the video doing what they did. It just put a cover, a damper, on all the good work that we are doing. But at the end of the day, I am comforted to know that most Belizeans do understand that we have a huge department and uh, there will be bad ones. No organization is perfect. And I'm not going to allow the two bad apples to rotten the bunch. And the commissioner has taken swift and decisive action. Since yesterday, I have been following this matter. I have spoken to both persons and uh, they felt comforted speaking to me about it. And having interviewed both of them, I am satisfied that the persons behind the video are indeed police officers. And I'm pleased to say that we have identified the three police officers involved. At this time, one is in custody. The other two resides in the Orange Walk district. I have spoken to the officer commanding Orange Walk and I believe by now they should have the other two or about to have the other two in custody. Let me make it emphatically clear that we are going to leave no stone unturned to ensure that those three idiots are dealt with and dealt with swiftly. We cannot have police officers behave in such a way towards our citizenry. And please let me say this, the conduct of those officers have nothing to do with a state of emergency because they all know what the powers of the police are. They all know 
what is expected of them during this time. I personally made it known to them. I believe that this is just an act of who they are. And uh, they need to be called out for the type of persons they are. And so hopefully by the end of the day today or tomorrow, we should be making an arrest. The only difficulty we're having at this time is that, as you would know, there are a group of persons who may have some connection or influence over the two individuals. I have contacted one of the attorneys this morning with a view to get the other individual because while I spoke to him yesterday and he told me what happened, he was to give a statement to the police and he had said that he, is, he was going to return today with his attorney to give the statement. Without the statement from the individual, we will not be able to do anything. But several calls to the attorney, I have not been able to get him, he's not answering my call. My thing is that if the attorney has so much interest in the interest of this case and the interest of his client, please bring the person forward so that we can get his story in writing and we'll be able to move the investigation forward. Without that, we will be at a stalemate. Does something like this merit their discharge? How does that process work? <laughs> of course, I, I wish I could discharge them today. It goes without saying. But again, there is a process. And we have to allow the process to occur. And I can assure you that once the process is completed, then they have to go. I don't want to preempt what my decision is going to be. But I can tell you that based on the evidence, what we know so far, there is no place for people like these in the department. They need to go. One of the individual is a corporal. He has served this department, I think, from 2008, which will give him 11 years. And he is supposed to be a mature individual. May I say that he have also, about a week ago, tendered his resignation from the department. That resignation has been accepted. But I'm going to rescind that resignation acceptance. And then we're going to deal with him through our disciplinary process for this matter. And then the outcome will determine if he resigns or he's dismissed. The police department has consulted and sought advice from the DPP's office on this matter. Commissioner Williams has also assigned ASP Marta Reese, the department's most senior expert in sexual cases, to quote, take the investigation where it ought to be. But there was even more alarm over the act of recorded sexual coercion when it was alleged that at least one of the victims suffer from a mental, severe mental disorder. If that's a fact that Commissioner Williams has outrightly disrupted, disputed that is, and here's what he said today about the mental capacity of both victims. Contrary to what Sun Kremlin Sunday Review, again, purport to call them, Mental, mental cases or they lack some mental capacity, I spoke to both of them and both of them spoke well to me. I, I see no challenge in them. Yes, they may to some extent not be as educated as we are, but not just because you do not possess sufficient education means that you are a mental case. They, they spoke well as far as I'm concerned. They explained themselves well. They gave a good account of what transpired on the night in question. And so I, I don't regard them as mental people. But while Williams might be downplaying the mental health issues of at least one of the victims, the Ministry of Health disagrees. This evening in a press release, the Ministry said that it was aware of his or her condition and appalled at the assault to the human dignity of both victims. 
The ministry also called on human rights actors to denounce the violation of rights of mentally disabled persons and to advocate that the violators be severely punished. Williams also outrightly rejected any similarities drawn between the act of sexual coercion and the weeks or the major incident of public police misconduct. That one happened in San Martin, where an elderly man was badly beaten by police. But Williams said that the act of sexual depravity could never be put under the same heading as the incident in San Martin. Police brutality or police misconduct have always been here. It didn't start with a state of emergency. It has always been here. And I don't want to put this incident in the same category as San Martin. I could understand, yes, police may get overzealous and use unnecessary force or excessive force. But I, don't, I, I cannot understand what could have entered the minds of these, I don't even want to refer to them as officers, to coerce two innocent agents into some sexual activity for their own gratification. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is past the mark. It, it is beyond it. Um, and uh, so I, I, to put this in the same boat as San Martin, no, cannot go. And it seems that Williams can't catch a break because the special envoy for women and children, Kim Barrow, in a press release this evening, lumped both incidents together, calling them incidences of police brutality against women and elderly persons. Mrs. Kim Simplis Barrow called for the elimination of all acts of violence at this trying time, claiming that they only serve to, quote, inflict bouts of fear and mistrust. Today, Commissioner Williams said that while he is Eager to investigate the San Martin abuse, the victims are still recovering and have yet to provide their statements. Professional Standard Branch had gone to record statements from the victims. The old man had asked that they return next week to get his statement. And uh, the young man who was hospitalized, I think he had requested for them to go back either today or tomorrow. So we have still not recorded their statement as yet, and we respect how they feel. In the sense that I think the, the, the elderly guy, he said that he wanted his attorney to be present when his statement is recorded, and so we respect that. So as soon as he's ready with his attorney, he will let us know, and then the officers from Professional Standard Branch will go and record his statement. And the same thing with the other person. When he's ready, then we'll go and record the statement. But in the time being, we're not able to proceed any further because we need the statements from them. And while that man received a beatdown for breaking curfew, almost 500 others will pay a massive fine. But Williams is optimistic that with such an expensive deterrent, arrests will start to decline. We had 14, 59 arrests over the course of the 24 hours. So um, we'll be just above 500. But we're seeing a decline now in the number of arrests. I think last, yesterday was 70 something and today is 59. So the arrests are going down. I, I, I hope that it is an indication that less and less persons are now on the streets. Fewer people on the streets is the ultimate goal in the battle to stop the spread of COVID-19. And to accomplish that goal, the state of emergency's most recent statutory instrument limiting the opening hours of grocery stores and effectively eliminated the only excuse to leave home. Williams says the only people expected on the streets are essential workers on the way to perform essential services. With the close of business places at four, that will be able to give us better control in terms of um, persons on the streets. They'll, once four o'clock strike, we can't, we'll no longer be getting excused from people that they're going to the shop, they're going to the banks, they're going here, they're going there. Four o'clock, everything closed. So only people who are going to be on the streets after 4 p.m. are essential workers. 
and uh, those will be essential workers who will be performing some essential, essential function. And, and in the absence of that, then they will not be allowed to be on the streets. And essential workers are not the working out. That's right. The commissioner says you cannot even exercise after 4 p.m. Now, outdoor exercise was permitted under the state of emergency last week. But the commissioner says it is only for those who exercise in the morning. No, sir, when it comes to exercise at that time after 4, is that permitted or is exercise solely limited to the morning time? Morning time. And if Commissioner Williams had it his way, even those caught exercising after four would be sent straight to jail. That's right, jail. Over the weekend on Facebook, Commissioner Chester made a public proposal to the Prime Minister and an open threat to curfew violators that they should be sent straight to Hatterville, just like the 100-plus alleged gangsters who are locked up. Today he told us that the proposals which he floated publicly was shot down. We are advocating for persons now, notwithstanding all the measures we've put into place, to be trooped directly to the Belize Central Prison. How does that work in the context of now creating a situation for prison authorities with, with containing these new individuals? Well, um, that was not approved. That solution was not approved. If you, I, I sure you have seen the, the revised SI. And so that will not be done. But we continue to do what we can with a view to ensure that we limit the number of persons on the street as best as we can. Turning now to other news, two days ago we told you how the three Central American butane importers filed for an injunction against the government in the courtroom of the new acting Chief Justice Michelle Arana. The three importers, Gas, Tomza Limited, Southern Choice Butane and Belize Western Energy Limited say that the government threatened to take action against them for simply wanting to lower the prices of their butane to give Belizeans a small break due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll remember how they announced on Friday that they were dropping their prices countrywide from 93 cents per pound and $4.20 per gallon to $0.88 cents per pound and $3.99 per gallon. They say that they were doing it out of goodwill to their customers. But yesterday, the management of all three companies received stern letters from Jose Trejo, the Comptroller of Supplies at the Belize Butane of Bureau of Standard. In those letters, Trejo said, quote, by issuance of said release dated April 1, 2020 to the general public on reduced prices and partaking in sale below the regulated price, your company is in flagrant violation of the supplies control regulations, end quote. Trejo goes on to say that the companies are, quote, forewarned that this irresponsible and intentional act of defiance towards the governing laws and regulations will not be tolerated. Nobody, corporate or sole proprietor, is above the law. Please note that this bold act to disregard the regulations will be addressed to the fullest extent of the law. End quote. So they have decided to speak up on this fight. And just before midday today, Audrey Matura, one of their attorneys, held a press briefing to discuss this dispute with the government. She told us that her clients are surprised that they are being threatened with penalties for trying to show goodwill to their customers in this time of need. Here's how she explained it. Last year, sometime in December, just before Christmas, the companies, they all gave a reduced price to consumers because the truth is, worldwide, the prices for butane is going down. When we did that, when they did that really, the government threatened them because they had lowered the prices and they complied. And but they complied because the government passed a statutory instrument number 57 of 2019 in which they're saying we don't want to give you all um, the ability for control prices they define control prices and they moved it from control prices to fixed prices we have filed an application for judicial review over the decision the government made to reduce or to reduce that um decision of theirs into law that matter is still before the court. However, our clients, all the gas companies, made the decision that since world prices are plummeting again, that it was unfair for them during this time of COVID crisis 
to decide to charge people the usual rate that the government has fixed, knowing very well that that is a form of exploitation because that's not what they're paying. What is happening then, the profit margin is too much and they say, well, as a form of helping, in this time of crisis, it would be good that we pass that benefit to the consumer. So on the 1st of April, they launched their promotional prices. As a result of that, the Belize Bureau of Standard, which is the one that deals with control prices, called Mr. Bautista, threatening him that they can go and take away their inventory. But since then, yesterday, they also sent letters they sent letters to the other companies threatening them. We gave you all copies of those letters. We are therefore saying that that is unjust. It is, this is the opposite of what you all had. When COVID crisis really set in here in Belize, what some of the stores were doing was price gouging. This com these companies, what are they doing? They're saying, look, the same way we know that the world market is lower, it is just right that we transfer these benefits to the consumer. We've never seen a government ever penalize anyone for trying to sell things for less to help the, the consumer. This is the first time we're seeing that. And so we need you all to know one of the reasons why we believe they're doing that. That reason is that, as you all know, the government has passed a legislation that creates a monopoly a monopoly that the government is part of it, and it's called a national gas company. For them, their projections, for their projections to work and for them to make the millions they hope to make on the backs of consumers, it is in the interest of the government to keep prices high. They cannot make the consumer in this country know that the prices of LGB, LPG worldwide has reduced and that the consumers deserve that reduction. That's what they fight. The two elephants, the elephants are fighting, and you, the consumers, are being trampled. And so our client has asked that we do this press briefing because they believe it's their social duty to let the consumer know and for the consumer to demand that they get the lower prices. In a late evening release, Jose Trejo, the Comptroller of Supplies at the Belize Bureau of Standards, sent out a press release defending the actions of his office. In his statement, he says, quote, based on the fact that the matters contained therein are currently live before a court of law, the government and the ministry responsible for supplies control will refrain from publicly engaging on any of the issues which touch and concern those live claims until the determination of those matters. Kindly note, though, that the government of Belize, through the ministry and by extension, the Supplies Control Unit recognizes the current economic challenges being faced by households and businesses and is prepared to ensure that lower prices are passed on to consumers when circumstances so warrant. As such, the government of Belize assures that at all times it acts in the best interests of consumers and will continue to monitor and adjust prices in accordance with the laws of Belize. End quote. Not to be left out of this ripe dispute, the PUP issued a release this evening saying, quote, what we absolutely cannot understand is how this government will attack the butane wholesalers simply because these entities have made the decision to slash the price of butane to Belizeans during these times of economic hardship. In these times of COVID-19, there is no room for political machinations and manipulations. End quote. The National Gas Company, which is the public-private entity that will take over the importation of butane from those same Central American importers, is also speaking up in its wide-open dispute. They aren't weighing in on the dispute between government and the Central American importers. National Gas Company is instead assuring the public that they will continue their preparations to become Belize's only importer of butane. National Gas Company says, quote, for its part, NGC will continue to prepare Belize's sovereign capacity to directly access world markets of liquidified petroleum gas, LPG, thereby strengthening Belize's self-sufficiency and preparedness for emergencies such as this. World market prices of petroleum products, including LPG acquired for sale in Belize, have fallen significantly, caused in part by the pandemic. This lower acquisition price should be passed on to the Belizean consumer 
by way of the regulatory procedures established for the LPG price setting. And we take a break now, but there's still a whole lot more news ahead. Students abroad tell us how they feel about their borders being closed to them. And Jules Vasquez has a satirical take on police abuses during the state of emergency. Don't go away. the time to sign up for the best postpaid plans in the country because Digi has double the data in all their plans. Now you can get even more done, connect even more, stream even more, create even more and share even more. All on the fastest mobile network that gives you the most coverage nationwide. Now is the time to go postpaid with plans starting as low as $49 monthly. Shared plans are also available, all with unlimited talk and text. So don't wait. Hurry over to your nearest Digi store to sign up today. Enjoy double the data in all postpaid plans only with Digi. Ask any landscape professional who they depend on for professional grade power tools, and the answer is always the same. Echo. 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 Ask any dealer who offers the most powerful, most durable, and most reliable equipment in the business, and they'll tell you. Echo. 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 Then ask yourself, doesn't your lawn and garden deserve the professional's choice? Echo. 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 The best outdoor power equipment you can buy.
7 News has learned that a Guatemalan fugitive who was wanted in his home country for the crime of murder was caught in Belize and was today returned to his country to face charges. He has been identified to us as Walter Jerome Rosales Garcia and we are told he was caught several days ago in the Stan Creek district. He was living in the San Juan village under an assumed identity until he was busted by police officers from the special branch. We are told that he had obtained a full list of Belizean documents under this name, including birth certificates and social security. He was fingerprinted, and when that matched the records of a wanted killer in Guatemala, police later handed him over to the immigration department. He was charged with immigration offenses, and an expulsion order was granted against him. This morning, the Belizean authorities handed him over to their Guatemalan counterparts. The Carazol Free Zone has been ordered to shut during the national state of emergency. But reports reaching our newsroom is that it is still being used to smuggle goods across the Rio Hondo to Mexico. This is because a large part of what comes out of the zone does so through means of informal trade. In other words, it goes through the back. And now that the zone is officially closed, reports say that informal trade has stepped up sharply with Mexican para pasadores, as they are called, slipping into the zone to smuggle the items across. Today via phone, we asked the CEO, Hilberto Campos, about it. There have been reports we have received that, in fact, um, there is informal exportation happening in the free zone and that the, that the free zone, even though it should be closed, continues to have export activity, so to speak, through the back door. That's a totally false. There is nothing true to that. Nothing at all is true. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we at the Free Zone have taken measures that we have the presence of the BDF, the, the Belize Defense Force. We have about 10 uh, soldiers uh, helping the, the local Free Zone security officers to do the inspections and to maintain the integrity of the Free Zone and the Free Zone fence. There's absolutely no uh, exportations. The Free Zone has been closed for over two weeks now, and uh, not the only the only activities presently at the Free Zone during Monday and Tuesdays, and sometimes Wednesdays, would be the importation of certain containers that are com coming from the port. This is to assist the investors not to incur an additional expense in the port. I am personally doing the inspections on a daily basis of the integrity of the fence line. I have seen video, I don't know the exact date the video was taken, but the, but the video shows breaches in the fences and a path from the fence straight into the nearby Rio Honda River with pallets in the area that people can use as a sort of footpath for the smugglers or as they are called, pasadores. Yeah, the, the pallets, the pallets they place uh, is not really for the smugglers, it's more for the officers that do the fence patrol on a daily basis, uh, especially at the handing over. Uh, there have been breaches or, or fence that has been cut on individual instances, but that is in the past. I'm talking about for the last two weeks, uh, I could assure you and the entire business community that there is nothing to do with no illegal activities. There are items that are in the zone which are the subject of informal trade. We have to be honest about this. And there is a great pressure from the, from the investors who have those stocked up to push them across into Mexico because there is a waiting market for it. Uh, regardless of the economic impact of those, I ha we have to abide by the decisions made. At these moments, at these days, you know, the same could apply for the general public who are under curfew, but we have to protect ourselves. And, and with the least activities, least movement possible in the free zone, that's it. We have to go by those by the laws and the and the orders given down to them. So that 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 is a no no, regardless of what the situation is. Okay, you 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 said that you had to change a lock on a warehouse. Uh, yeah, the, the, we had a, a a warehouse positioned in a very funny way, and that was never been used before, and that uh, goods were stuck there to prevent any temptations. We. Uh, we went and we installed new locks so that these would not be touched any at all. Campus says that they may soon stop few companies still clearing containers from the port. 
Public servants will not be paid until after Easter. It's an unprecedented six-day salary delay and one that Financial Secretary Joseph Wade says only became necessary, quote, as the economy grounded to a halt and revenues dried up. The salaries, which had been set to be paid today, April 8th, for the 15th pay period, will not be paid until April 14th. GOB is legally obliged to pay salaries twice a month, but there are traditional convenience pay days that public servants have come to expect shortly before the Christmas and Easter holidays. Wade told Krem News that salaries will be paid on the 14th and that, quote, nobody will be short a dollar. He added that it's an inconvenience to some, but we are all in different times together, difficult times together, that is. And that he is sure that the rank and file of public service will certainly understand. As you probably know by now, the Ministry of Health has a hotline set up to take calls from the public during this COVID-19 crisis. They have advised persons not to show up to the hospital if they suspect that they may be infected with the coronavirus. That can cause those patients to put other Belizeans at risk of contamination. Instead, the Ministry wants them to call the hotline and seek advice on how best to address the situation. As you would imagine, the staff at the Ministry of Health is stretched thin as frontline workers against this pandemic. So this week, they're getting much needed help from the staff at their sister government agency, Niche. Since Niche's office is closed due to the curfew and the state of emergency, a group of their employees has decided to aid the Ministry of Health by manning their hotlines and taking the flood of calls from the worried general public. This evening, we spoke with one of those Niche employees via telephone about that decision and the experience to temporarily join the front lines most of us have started to work from home and for some of us we have our assigned duties and um while some people can access certain information from home others are tasked to do other things you know and so one of that being is that we were asked by um the president to assist minister of health with the call since well, they have been receiving, you know, a lot of calls over the past weeks, I believe. And um, so it was three of us. And being there, honestly, uh, yesterday, um, I can talk about yesterday since I started with them yesterday. We received, like, almost 200 calls. Um, and it's just basically the general public calling to ask certain questions. Um, most of them is about the relief aid that they are receiving through the government some are to report suspected cases and well you know others just call about the different emergency office center contact number and to find out where they can receive certain access to health care in the event that they feel that someone is a suspected case or so forth they said that i think on monday they were receiving like a lot of calls and since they didn't had much staff there to take the calls then with the assistant it has been quite helpful for them According to Argueta, the Ministry of Health staff should need less help from them next week. If you've ever returned to Belize via Cancun, you'll know the feeling of relief experienced at the sight of the Welcome to Belize signs as you cross that Rio Hondo. But if you were to try to come back right now, well, you wouldn't be welcomed because as of Sunday, April 5th, Belize's borders were closed even to nationals. And in the second part of Cherise Halsal's chat with three Belizean students abroad, she asked them how it felt to hear that, at least for now, that they can't come home. And coming back to the closure of Belize's borders, I wondered how these nationals responded to being told that they couldn't come home. I am very happy that the government um, has taken the necessary steps in this regard to ensure the safety of all Belizeans, because I think that is you, you have to look at the bigger picture um, it makes me, because it's not only international students that would be going home, you see, so it makes me feel much better knowing that they're, they're trying to deal with something as unique as this pandemic. And I personally choose, chose not to go home because I was afraid that I would, I mean, I have to take a bus from here and then take a plane from, so it would be a lot of movement for me. And I was thinking that there, there's, there's a high possibility that I would be able to contract the virus along the way. And then I would take that home to my family and friends, and I did not want to put them at risk. And so I do, I do agree with the government closing the, the borders to students um, in, you know, ensuring that the rest of the, the, the country is, 
is safe. Honestly, I did, and this this might come off kind of strange, but I did think it was a good idea because if, I mean, this we had enough time to plan to get home if we wanted to get home. And I know everyone's circumstances are different. Uh, fortunately, I am on a scholarship and I'm still receiving my scholarship, so I can afford to be here. And I know not everybody's like that. And I know some people really want to get home, especially, you know, to be with family. You feel safer home. You have to think big picture, too, because, I mean, you, if you're coming from a place with, uh, where the pandemic is at a greater risk than Belize, you are going to be a carrier. And when you get home, you do need to take the preventative measures that government has put in place. I understand why they have implemented that uh that policy um uh, i i am fully aware of the risk that i pose uh to the country were i to decide to get on a plane and try to enter the country um but it's still very tough just knowing that uh, there really is no possibility uh for me to be close to my family at this point well i did upload a screenshot of it to my IG story and all my friends from other countries were like what you can't be serious like what um, I just said well I understand why uh, why it's being done this way uh, we we are a small country and it, it's just they it's hard for foreigners or well yeah foreigners to understand uh, the reality in Belize and I, this, as, uh, the way I look at it, is a type of war, and sacrifices must be made uh, during a war. Sharice Halto, 7 News. The closure of Belize's borders to nationals is expected to last for the duration of the state of emergency. And turning now to much lighter news, we have to laugh after what may otherwise might make us cry. The Belize we are all living in today seems to many of us like it's out of some dystopian novel. Indeed, if we had told you one month ago that in Holy Week you'd have to be locked up in your house by 4 p.m. or face arrest, well, you would have laughed. But such are the times that we are living in and dying by with COVID-19. All over the world, personal liberties have been abrogated in the legitimate interest of public health. It's very necessary, and we cannot argue with that. But what we can argue with is the abuses by the police during this time when they have sweeping powers to detain, arrest, and apparently harass. Well, that's what they did on Faber's Road a few nights ago. And it led to a scene that seemed to Jules Vasquez like it was from a science fiction movie. Here's his take. We knew something good had to come out of this curfew. At night, citizens huddle in their homes while pedestrians scuffle in fear and the police rule the night while darkness covers the land. Here on Farber's Road, a good citizen tried to capture what he felt was an unlawful and unjust arrest and the police whacked his phone into warp speed. Apparently proud of the ill-tempered terminal velocity, the commissioner concluded thusly. I think he looked for that one day, right? So I, I, I leave that as that. We were, we were, we were, we were, that's all for. I think he looked for that one day. The warped patrol could be coming soon to a corner near you. We were, we were, we were, we were, that's all for. And finally tonight, a faint glimmer of hope from the city that became global ground zero of the coronavirus has ended its lockdown after 11 weeks. Just after midnight on Wednesday, March 8, the city's 11 million residents were told that they are finally free to travel in and out of the city. 
The occasion was marked with a light show on either side of the Yangji River, with skyscrapers and bridges radiating animated images of health workers and displays of the words Heroic City, a title bestowed on Wuhan by the President Xi Jinping. Along the riverbanks and bridges, people waved flags, chanted Wuhan, let's go, and sang China's national anthem. And those lights are a beacon of hope to the rest of the world, still battling through a dark, dark time. A beacon that tells us that there is hope for and end to this frightening and crippling global pandemic. And that's all we have for you for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Indira Craig. Watch streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com. And remember to keep yourself and others safe. Stay at home and maintain your safety and hygienic practices. Social distancing of at least three feet. Washing your hands for 20 seconds. Using hand sanitizer or just soap and water and not touching your face. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay alert, but also stay calm. Don't panic and... Make sure to join me back here tomorrow at 6. Curfew starts at 8. So please, please stay indoors. Have a good night.